Welcome everybody to the Clear Tai Chi Mastermind Meeting for Friday, September 9th of 2022. Uh, um, my name is Richard Clear, your resident host. And with us today is Art Don in the Washington, D.C. area. Well, everyone, I'm in Greenbelt, Maryland. That is 12 miles east of Washington, D.C. Welcome. Thank you. Jerry Blake Smith in Cleveland, Ohio. Hello. My school's Emerald Valley Tai Chi, and I'm, bare, I'm based in Lakewood, Ohio, and I have classes also in Berea, Ohio. Welcome. Matt Holker, who's got my name on his thing there, Richard Clear, and he's at his family's in Minnesota today. He is the regional organizer for the Knoxville, Maryville, Maryville area outside of Knoxville. Welcome. Hi, everybody. Not sure how Richard Clear got stamped on my image, but obviously I am Matt Holker. The uh, Philip Chan in Columbus, Georgia. Hello. Welcome. To, today is his interview for uh, regional organizer interviews. And Chris Walsh in Maine, he's going to tell you what parts. Thank you, Sifu. I, I'm in Hollowell, Maine, just outside of Augusta, Maine. Well, thank you. Mark Mashad in Michigan. He's going to central Michigan. He's going to tell you what parts. <clears throat> Hi. Yeah, it's uh, the Midwest Michigan area covering Grand Rapids and Lansing area. Welcome. Jim Cantor, who is coming to you from Atlanta today, but is the regional organizer for part of Costa Rica. And he's going to have to tell you what parts. Oh, you're on mute, Jim. My center is uh, the Wuchi Energy Arts. I'm based out of Las Catalinas, which is a town in Guanacaste, which is about 45 minutes from the Liberi Airport on the Pacific Coast. Ah, welcome. Hi, Talbert, coming to you from, I was going to say Austin, but it's not Austin. It's <laughs> San Antonio. San Antonio. <laughs> hey, y'all. Hey, I'm actually in Converse right outside of San Antonio. The name of my school, well, my club is Warrior Tai Chi. Uh, be happy to have you come out and visit us. Welcome. Jim Kelly in Boca Raton, Florida. Yep, sunny South Florida. No hurricanes yet, Knockwood. <laughs> you can check us out. Uh, we have a school down here in West Boca. And if you want to visit virtually, we got uh, West Boca Tai Chi on Facebook. We try to keep up on that. Welcome. And Sheila Bell and other parts of Costa Rica, and she can tell you what parts. Hey, everybody. Yeah, I'm also in Guanacaste. I give class in Playa del Coco and in Liberia. And I bet Jim and I are getting some of the same rain. <laughs> we have a storm front in the Caribbean right now, but uh, it's good for the plants to get that water. Cool. All right. So today's interview is for Philip Chan. And before we begin with that, I want to promote for you the, if you like things that we talk about on our, uh, on these podcasts, et cetera, and want to try out the Tai Chi uh, like that, then the Clear Tai Chi Level 1 DVDs, and we also have the online for that program and curriculum, that is at clearmartialarts.com. The other, the other uh, thing that we want to promote for you is that every year in June, we have the Clear Tai Chi Gathering, and most of the teachers that you see on our podcast are teaching there, and we have some guest instructors, and we've already got some great ones coming for our next, for the next one this coming June, and it is, uh, it is a very reasonably priced event with great food and great people and great fun. And if you are interested in checking that out further and coming, go to TaiChiGathering.com and it will have the list of instructors and classes and, and events and, and things. Matt, anything to add to any of those things? Um, no, I mean, they're not really, they're both, you know, great, uh, great ways to, to get more involved in clear Tai Chi and to, um, to, you know, share with 
fellow people at the gathering and to learn yourself from the online materials. Um, they're just, just everything we talk about, like, like Sifu said, if you're, if you're interested in some particular subject or you want to get started in clear Tai Chi, um, you know, those are both great ways to do that. Clearmartialarts.com obviously available all the time. Um, and then the gathering once a year, if you can make it to the gathering, man, that is a blast. We, we have so much fun. So, uh, so do try to join us there. Um, but if you can't, there's always clearmartialarts.com and you can definitely, you know, take charge of your own training there. All right. So without further ado, Philip Chan interview questions. Let me start by letting you know that Phil is an advisor for Clear Tai Chi. So this interview is going to be a little bit different because most of the folks are teachers of Clear Tai Chi. However, they're, however, they're doing that in their community and they're structured. But Phil, um, Phil is retired and he, um, and like I said, he's an advisor for Clear Tai Chi. He actually first started Tai Chi in the 1960s. So he's been doing it for a long time, at least parts of it and at times and all that. And as we go through the interview and towards the end of the interview, you'll understand a lot better why Phil is an advisor for Clear Tai Chi. So uh, what we normally start with is your name and your school name and all of that. And so Phil, your name is? I'm Philip Chan. Um, and tell us, it says, uh, uh, tell us your school situation, including satellite classes, city and location. And I know you're retired and not teaching classes at this time. Um, and then you, but you taught there until COVID came, is that right? That's right. I, I taught up until, I think my last class was in January of, uh, I guess it was 2020, uh, just before COVID hit. And I, I quit a couple weeks before things got really bad. So, and I haven't started up since. And I'm, I'm still sheltering in place, basically. Yep. Okay. And you're in Columbus, Georgia. All right. How many years have you been study, actually studying Tai Chi? When did you start and that kind of thing? Well, it's, it's been very much off and on. I, I started in 1964. Uh, Chengman Cheng had just arrived in Chinatown, New York City, and he was kind of the buzz of the Chinatown community. And my father dragged my mother and me to take some classes uh, in Chinatown, and uh, it was an interesting experience. I think Tam Gibbs actually did most of the teaching. Uh, Professor Chang was in the building, but he didn't do most of the teaching. And there was some dialect issue where where he didn't, my father didn't speak the same dialect as he did. So he couldn't speak to uh, the professor directly. So. We only did about two lessons. And then um, a bunch of these Chinese merchants on Long Island got together and they hired William C.C. C. Chen, who was pretty famous and um, was a young man in those days. <laughs> and uh, he gave lessons in a basement in a house in Levittown on Long Island. And so I, uh, I learned at least part of the Yang 37 from William C.C. C. Chen. Yeah. And, yeah. Then, and then I went off to college and, uh, and then I actually, in college, I did some Okinawan Wei Chi Ru. And then I did a couple of uh, years with Japanese Shotokan when I was in college. And then from there, uh, I went off to medical school and there wasn't much time for anything. Uh, and then um, during my residency, I got to train off and on with Robert Smith in Bethesda, Maryland. And that was very delightful. And uh, he used to give lessons in the parking lot of the YMCA. It was either on a Saturday or Sunday morning. And then um, we would have breakfast afterward. And that was delightful. And I would always try to sit next to Robert Smith and hear wonderful stories. 
Robert Smith yeah. wrote over half a dozen different books where he was highlighting specific Tai Chi masters, and he was instrumental in helping Chen Man Ching go to another level of fame um, while he was up in New York and all of that. And he was one of Chen, right. he was one of Chen Man Ching's students, um, and like that. So, uh, so okay. Um, what year did you no. start teaching? Oh, go ahead. What were you going to say? So the so the other interesting thing is um, the seminal book during the fifties and sixties. There was very little written about martial arts, and uh, the seminal book there was a seminal book written by Robert Smith with Don Drager, and um, I got to spend some time with Don Drager, who was a Japanese stylist, and uh, I got a consult for uh, a a skin lesion on his uh, lower leg. And I did a biopsy and it was erythema nodosum. And it was uh, related to a uh, gastrointestinal cancer that uh, he was actually dying from at the time. So he had been living in Japan. Then he went to Tripler because that was the nearest military place. And he was, you know, he had access to that. Um, but in any case, I got, I invited him to dinner. I got a chance to have dinner with Don Drager, which was just an incredible experience. It was very, very, one of the most memorable evenings of my life and really got to meet a very, very interesting man. He taught me uh, at that time or a different time, I'm not sure. He taught me how to draw a katana out of a, out of a sheath and to how to put it back in. And then um, he had a one of his teachers taught Jota, which is the, a stick that's about shoulder height. And I, for about a year, I trained in uh, Jota um, with, with that instructor. Um, but uh, Don Drake was just a totally charismatic instructor and a real inspiration, so. Um, anyway, that was that was a very exciting part of my life. <laughs> cool. When when did you start teaching Tai Chi? So I started teaching Tai Chi in 1992, and it's a very it's a very twisted story. So when I retired from the military, I had very bad arthritis in my hip. And I couldn't run, I couldn't play tennis, I really couldn't dance more than 15 minutes in a day. And I was looking for something that was somewhat physical and interesting. And I hadn't done Tai Chi for a long time, but the apartment complex offered free lessons. Uh, one of the residents taught Tai Chi and they gave him a cut on his um, rent if he would teach. And I was very fortunate because I was the only one that showed up consistently. So he would teach me and then all the other people that would sort of come at odd and end times, his wife would teach them. So I got one-on-one -on -one instruction for about a year and a half and we met for two hours twice a week. And then uh, sometimes we would meet for a couple of hours during the week because he lived in the apartment complex and he wasn't working. So that was like a really wonderful experience. And he taught me the... Um, the uh, Yang 24 and also the Yang Long Form. And so one of my claim to fame, I want to brag about it, and you can, you can cut this out if you want to, is I learned the Yang 108 uh, movement Yang Form, and I learned it in four days. Four days? Four days. And you can memorize it? And I know you had the, I know you had medical school where they, they're full of information <laughs> that you got to somehow remember it all. Wow. So don't forget, yeah, so don't forget, I, by I that time, I knew that, I just, you know, huh? <laughs> go ahead. That's my claim to fame, yeah. <laughs> did so, you remember uh, it later, or did you learn it in four days and forget it in the next four days? Oh, no, no, no. So it was, um, I already knew the 37, the Yang 37. Okay. And the Yang 37 is kind of like the long form without the repetition. So I knew, right. I had memorized yeah. that. And then I had been working on the 24 forms to get to a level where I could teach it. I so it. I was familiar with all the movements. Yeah. It was just the sequence. Yep. And so, and okay. then, 
And then for a few that weeks, helps clarify that a bunch. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, I, I had a head start. So for a few weeks, we would just run through it once during the class. And then for so then I decided to learn it. So I got the uh, uh, videotape on it and I spent a day learning part one and a day learning part two and a day learning part three. But I spent all day. I mean, I, as soon as I got up, I started work with the video. And if I wasn't working with the video and doing it physically, I was doing it in my head. And if I was if I was eating dinner with someone, I was pretending to be paying attention to the conversation. And I was doing it in my head <laughs> during the meal. So I really that was, uh, you know, my waking hours for those four days was was it. But yeah, so I got that. And then I also had to uh, learn to do it. Uh, the 108 um, mirror image. And okay. uh, the first part of the first part mirror image is really easy but the second and third part of the image is was, was really a challenge but anyway okay. that's that's my claim to fame in tai chi <laughs> so. now when i learned the 108 there are there are at least in the 108 that i learned there's all the moves you normally will see in like the 24 and in like the 37s and all that but there are easily 20 to 30 or more moves that are not in the simpler sets for what I for what I originally learned. So were were there there were some moves in the hundred I'm asking you this or were there some oh. moves in 108 that did not exist in the other Tai Chi that you had at that point? What I remember, and I haven't done the long form for a while, I, I think it, it wasn't a lot. It was maybe six or eight. Okay. So it was that was that was not a lot. The big challenge was was just getting everything in sequence and remember it. Yeah. yeah. So the new moves, there were a few, but not a lot. Yep. The, uh, yeah. I found that even the 13, I tend to do our 13. Like if somebody knows the 24, the 8 and the 13, they're really easy to pick up because it's just uh -huh. the same moves, basically, with little nuances on it that are clear Tai Chi from my different instructors. The... Uh, and the way that they taught to do things and why and how and all that and, and informed by different schools and styles and thoughts and all that anyways, but little nuance differences in terms of that. And then it is, it's just memorize the sequence and then going through it on the other side, uh, like on the 13, I tend to do it on the other side. And I remember when I first did it, uh, a couple of moves I had to think about, but then it got to the point where it's just very interchangeable where it doesn't, you know, it's not a confusing thing anymore. The only confusing thing is which side did I start on? Not uh, which I did not how to do the move. Right? If you're really into it and you forget, right? Where you know you're just enjoying it. Anyways. Or you're so into anyway, it. so I I I I got to that. And then it was very interesting. So I had been teaching Reiki since 1990. So this was about two around the year 2000. I'd been teaching Reiki for about 10 years and I, I could do Reiki. I was a, a, a effective practitioner and I could teach it and I could give the ability to other people. And so I was effective, but I didn't feel energy coming into me very much. Okay. So I could send it, but I didn't sense it. My ting was not very well developed. Okay. So it's not and, that you weren't getting energy, it's that you couldn't feel it. Feel it, right. Yeah. And then in the form, in, so I've been doing Tai Chi and I learned all these different things. You know, I learned all three sets, but I didn't feel it. Okay. And the interesting thing is that instructor moved Chi, but he pushed it away. He, he, did, he didn't pay attention. He tried to, he, he intentionally ignored it. Because he felt it distracted him. It was it was bizarre. So this was the best thing, and he's ignoring it. So uh, anyway, <laughs> anyway, so I was practicing. I was practicing doing it. I remember, and he taught it with the front leg with the toe turned in. Okay. Yeah. So I don't do that now, but I was doing it at that time, and I was I was practicing and with doing the form a little bit differently than I had. And then suddenly one day, oh, that's what they're talking about, feeling the energy in your body. And I said, 
If I can learn how to teach that to other people, then I can use that to hook them into taking Reiki classes. Uh -huh. So that was that was a major incentive for um, you know for teaching Tai Chi, and you know I was retired, and so making a little extra income was always good. And then what happened was um, there was an instructor in the local college who taught Hua Yu Tai Chi, which is uh, odd. I, it's kind of an odd system, which is taught here. And he was a he was a prominent instructor in this town for a number of years. And then Hua he Yu left town. Was why do you know the translation for that? Hua, no, I, Hua, I, I believe you said it sounds like transforming. You, depending, there's a lot of different little enunciations that depending on how you said it, and, right. and you said it kind of general, um, that could be either somebody's name, the whole thing could be, or it could be that it's got a very specific connotation. I'd be curious to know what they were saying there. The English spelling was H-A-W-Y-U. Oh. So I, I don't try to get the inflection in there like that. Okay. Yeah, my, my Chinese is not very good. <laughs> and I don't think he knew any Chinese. <laughs> but anyway, he left. And it was a, it's an interesting style. Uh, I think it does a lot of this. I think it does the kind of spiraling that Chen does. I'm not sure. I, I, I wasn't in I, I wasn't far enough along the line to sort that out. But it's yeah. a very odd system. There are like 500 movements in the okay. form, in the full form. So it's nuts. I mean, I, to me, I had no interest in learning that because, it, you know, you, you spend years just doing the choreography. Yeah. Anyway, uh, my instructor got invited to uh, to teach when when uh, this other guy left, and then he kind of he kind of had a little bit of a chip on his shoulder, and he stepped on some toes, and I got to. I got to teach. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, so that's, I started um, at the college and then uh, there was a, uh, someone from a church that was taking it at the college and she didn't want to wait until the college class started. So she actually drummed up a bunch of people from her church and I had a class very quickly in the church. And that's where I was still teaching at that church. I was still teaching okay. um, until COVID. Yeah. Yeah, so near so yeah. So for a long but that's time. really a that's really a backdoor way to getting into teaching Tai Chi if uh, I've ever heard of one. <laughs> the uh yeah, I'm hearing you. Um when how what year do you think you were first introduced or or do you know what year were you first introduced to clear Tai Chi or the first time you saw any of that or I you know I, I looked at my records. I think it may have been around 2014 or 2015. I, I did purchase the um, formless style. I think that's what it's called. It's, it's a big DVD set on, on, on that advanced thing. And I and then um, I purchased the, uh, the fighting uh, series, the 19 DVD fighting series. Yep. And uh, and then I've been looking, you know, being involved in Reiki, uh, I was always very curious about emitting, emitting Qigong, where you had the practitioner and he would send energy to the other person. And uh, and then I saw an, an ad someplace on, on YouTube or someplace, uh, or I'd gotten on the mailing list already about oh, the Falkland class. Got an, right. got an email, yeah. Right. So I think I'd have to look at my diploma, but I think I did the Falkland. My first real exposure to you was in Falkland um, in 2016, I believe. Okay. And I remember our first conversation and... Um, I... I, re I remember there was a conversation I, and I think I was asking something about, you know, what part of your hand do you, when you do an iron palm, which part of your palm do you hit with? I remember, but I re we were in the school and I was in the process of registering and you were kind enough to answer the question. So that was, 
that was my first memory of you. <laughs> I got to think the answer was, if it's a true iron bomb, it's any part you want. Whole That's thing. a rocket. Yeah. Right. Right. Anyway. So that, yeah, so that's when I started. And then uh, the other workshops I've taken, I've taken the um, internal push hands, and then I took the uh, beginning Falcon workshop also. Cool. Um, yeah, what was he going to ask you here? Um, okay, so... What other martial arts have you studied? You studied like, uh, not just whatever, but what martial arts have you studied? So I, I mentioned I did Okinawan Weichiru, Japanese Shotokan, um, different variations. I've done a little bit of Sun and a little bit of Wu and a little bit of, of um, and obviously a lot of Yang and then uh, Tai Chi. I've done the clear Tai Chi. Um, Let's see what else. I did a little bit of kendo mm -hmm. and the jodo. Yeah. And um and then as far as video work, I've I, I've done I've done video work with uh, defensive cane. And then I did the cold steel uh DVDs yeah. on uh Machete and also saber, Western saber. And then you also did taijutsu, right? The ninjutsu. Oh, <laughs> shame on me! Yeah, I, I did. I did. Uh, uh, Hatsumi's oh, I know we were Buji. talking about it the other night. <laughs> <laughs> Hatsumi's buji cut. I did that yeah for several years, right? And then, and with that, I actually had you know I had real instructors and and uh, yeah. yeah. So that was yeah, that was a big part of my I, life for a long time. Good instead of on video yep yeah and then uh in clear tai chi you've got the level one the push hands level one the ba gung one through four uh some of the intermediate um uh, and that kind of stuff and then like i've known every time i put out something new on fighting um you get the you end up getting like the like the you started off by having the formless fighting method uh, right. and which is like a yang shahu method and then um and then you got the, like you said, the combat DVDs, which were more about application and various aspects uh, of the moves having to do with fighting, including poison hand stuff and and uh, some of the democ and then straight out arm breaks and uh, neck breaks, and, you know, breaking stuff and then throws. And, uh, self-defense applications that were just the simple ones that kind of come off of them and that kind of thing. So that's, that's, that's all about that. And then you've got our one that we did where it was um, fighting applications as well. Um, right. And so, you, and so I've noticed you get a lot, you tend, you, you like, you seem to like the whole art, including the energy stuff and, but very, very drawn towards that fighting part. Is that, is that, what is, what, is, what is that, doing for you i'm trying to think how to word this well um why is what i'm getting at why the fighting parts oh <laughs> that's an uh that's a deeper question i hadn't thought of that <laughs> well, what i guess i'm getting at is it just because you wanted self-defense and you wanted it from tai chi or is it because it's informing part of the art or other things that you're doing somehow, or it's just more of intellectual interest. What what's the motivation there? It's it's very complex and it's changed over time. So one of the issues is a lot of boys learn they roughhouse with their fathers. Hmm. It's very common, and so you learn basic wrestling skills. It's pretty common, or with your brothers. Yeah. And uh, and then some people learn some basic boxing from their fathers. Um, so that's not uncommon. Uh, my father was from China and he was not, he didn't interact me with those in those ways and he didn't have those skills. 
So, you know, if I got into a wrestling situation with a friend, I was totally lost. I did not have that background. Uh, and there were a couple of situations where I felt very powerless, where, um, right, once I was bullied by someone in third grade and in other times uh, there was someone else that was bullied. And, you know, I'm not sure getting into that fight would have been a good choice, but I could, I didn't have a choice. I didn't have the skills. So that was a, that was a, like a life deficiency I felt for a long time. And so I wanted, I wanted to be, and then there was that, uh, there was a big story in, um, maybe I was in high school where there was a woman that was basically attacked on the street and she was screaming and no one did anything, you know, and they didn't, no one even called the cops, yeah. you know, it was just, this, it that? was this terrible situation. And Kitty I just want, I still didn't catch that, Matt. Her name was Kitty Genovese. Exactly. Wow. Right. And, you know, I just, you know, in it now, at particularly at my age, if I was in an apartment and I heard that, the smart thing to do would be to call the cops at least and maybe take some photographs. Whether I should get involved in it, I don't know. But I, I certainly want, didn't want to, I wanted to be in a position where if I needed to fight either for myself or somebody else, I had the skills. Sure. So, yeah. so, that, so that, my question goes more to do with the Tai Chi, obviously. Are you doing the fighting part of the Tai Chi because you're finding something um, that's really a better quality of, of self-defense? Or is it more like you're doing Tai Chi, so you might as well do your self-defense with Tai Chi as well? That's that's kind of more the thrust of where I'm coming from. So uh, my what my perspective is this. In terms of if I ever get into a situation where I think there's going to be a problem, I'm going to carry a cane with me. My feeling is I can deter a physical conflict mm -hmm. with a show of force with a cane much better than anything I can do with my hand. And I can probably hit someone harder with a cane than I can with my hand. So, you know, if I'm in a situation where I, I anticipate a problem and, in, and a firearm's not appropriate, I would use a cane. I'm with you. So um, back to my question though, which is you're doing the self-defense part of the Tai Chi and like have done a lot with that. Yes. Is that just part of, well, you're doing Tai Chi, so you'll do the self-defense too? Or is there something about Tai Chi, about self-defense and Tai Chi that is you're you're finding you like it better or it's easier to do or it's uh just sat settled an intellectual curiosity what is the what is the thrust there what is the so the next step is over time what i realize is that as far as empty hands the best thing i the thing that would be easiest for me to apply in empty hands would be your hard style. Okay, sure, because it's simple and easy to remember and you can really use Right, it. so I am really looking forward to studying the DVDs for the, your workshop in January. I am drooling over that, okay? Uh -huh. um, and then, but the rest of it is, um, I'm do, uh, it's both. I, I like doing Tai Chi and I might as well learn all aspects of it. Uh, and uh, part of it's kind of like a tribute to my father where I went on to other systems and, uh, you know, he was always kind of fried that I never really pursued Tai Chi when he was alive. Uh, yeah. And so I kind of, as a tribute to him, I really wanted to explore Tai Chi and all of its access as much as I can. Yeah. I got you. Cool. So none of you, the rest of you have that as as a motivation to do Tai Chi. <laughs> uh, some of us are dads. I, I, some of us have that. Okay. Right. Yeah.
Uh, I don't know for Tai Chi, maybe. Yeah. So yeah, so that and the whole energy aspects of fighting just fascinates me. So, you know, I've been involved in the healing aspect of energy with Reiki and Falcon, but to be able to explore the the um, combative aspects of energy, it, it really fascinates me. I mean, I, it just rounds out my understanding of energy in a way that someone that only did healing wouldn't have. I'm hearing you. Now you also taught the types. You also, when you were teaching, you taught at two local hospitals, correct? Uh, yeah, I taught at the college in their adult education, and I taught at the church, and then um, I taught at two different hospitals uh, for several years at a time. So there was there was a time I I think I had five different classes in a week in different locations. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, and, and, right, and, and some of them were geared for uh, for retired people. They were at lunchtime when old people like to go to classes and others were, were scheduled for 5 or 5.30 and the target population were those with people that were still working. Yeah, cool. The, uh, so you got some other credentials there and including some medical ones and all that. Um, give us Give us some idea of what those credentials are. So uh, my day job over my lifetime is I'm a board certified dermatologist. And so I went to medical school and then I did a residency with the army. Um, I did have a short um, position as an assistant clinical professor at the University of uh, Hawaii. So that wasn't a big deal. Basically, if you if you were at the, that army hospital and you did some teaching of medical students from the university, then you got to get to be an assistant clinical professor. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I also uh, had a assistant clinical professor position at the. Uniform Services uh, University of the Health Sciences in Bethesda. And uh, that was to talk about complementary medicine. And so I, I, I gave some lectures and I actually gave a level one Reiki class to some from um, first, first year medical students. So that was like a kind of a cool thing to do. Uh, and then I've published, I've had um, a a few truly scientific publications. I've had um, some some uh, clinical reports in scientific and, and medical journals. And then I published a lot of uh, sort of satirical humorous articles uh, for letters to the editor, either in newspapers or in uh, medical non-economics was another uh, publication that I did a lot of. For your uh, for your articles, were they something you where you had actually done some research, or was it things that you were finding through practice that you kept seeing certain things, and then figured things out because of what you were seeing or treating and how you were treating? What was the thrust of? So it was both. Some of it was was a report on studies, and some of it was like a case report where you got an interesting case and you worked it up and then you reported on what your findings were. Okay. So, yeah. so I had both. Yeah. All right. And then I've got here that you're a lifetime member of Mensa. Yes. And, and then the other thing I have, and this is also kind of far out, is I have level one and level two of the level two of the soul realignment course. And that's um, that's a system where you learn to plug into the Akashic Record to get answers. And it uh, has some similarity with going to the observer. Mm -hmm. And then... Soul realignment, you say? Soul I'm sorry? Realignment. Soul realign realignment? Yes, soul realignment. Okay. Right. Okay, Dalton. Okay, and then the other things, I guess, at the college, I've also, um, 
I taught Tai Chi, and I also taught blues harmonica. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, Jim, sometime I want to jam with you. I was going to say, you have to play for us sometime, too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm on board, Philip. Anytime, buddy. So do you have you have your guitars in uh, Costa Rica? Some of them. Okay. Some of them. Okay. Yeah, the house so is you ma- Are you maintaining your house in Atlanta or are you going to sell that? Uh, we moved. We're, we've been homeless technically since June. Okay. I'm, I'm visiting that- my daughter right now here in Atlanta for uh, okay. two Okay. Well, anyway, I, I, I'd love to jam with you for... Uh, on harmonica, I'm good. I'm, I'm trying to learn the electronic sax and... I'm not quite ready yet with that. That's that's it. Okay. That's good fun. And you have a fun. keyboard behind you too. Say again. And you have a keyboard behind you. Yeah, I got it. That's a training tool. It's not something I play with any skill. Yeah. Me too. But yes. <laughs> when we're settled. I'm I'm ready for some Brownie McGee if you can give. <laughs> Do you have any notable teaching accomplishments, uh, specific student successes, health or self-defense? Yes. So I have, uh, I don't have any famous students, but I have, uh, I have two s- success stories. Uh, one is very twisted and one is a little more straightforward. So when I first started teaching um, at the church, uh, I, I was teaching maybe it was very early on, and one of the students' wives came up and he said she's so happy because her husband, for many years, had lost the range of motion in his right arm. And he went to my class, and we were doing qigong exercises. Um, you know, qigong exercise to warm up. And after the first lesson, all of a sudden, he got most of the range of motion in his right arm, and now. When he plays golf, he has a real swing, not a really shortened swing. And he took off like three, at least three strokes from his score. And he plays every day. So golf was a really big thing in his life. And he's playing much better. And I thought, oh, I've got this cheese stuff down. And I figured that he had, I figured he had gone to orthopedists and had x-rays and MRIs and gone to physical therapists. And they weren't just weren't able to help him but it was the chi that helped well as it turns out there was just one day he woke up and he couldn't move his arm but it didn't hurt so he never saw anybody he just he never went to anybody his... even though he had an immobilized arm he, he I... just never worked at it because it didn't hurt well i figured out what happened is he had dislocated his shoulder yeah and then in the qigong exercise just the external thing it was like an accidental reduction in the dislocation. So I changed his life, but it was nothing to do with chi. It was just like a simple. You know, and you know what? Whenever, when you've got something like that, that's that kind of life affecting, you don't really care what fixes it as long as it gets fixed. <laughs> exactly. Okay. So, yeah. Especially if it shaves three strokes off your game. That's a yeah. big deal. That's yeah, if, they're pro, if they're a pro, they'll pay big money for that ability. For that. <laughs> so that was that was one. The second big success was a young woman, and I, I didn't look up her name. And she was about 19 when she started with me, and she had brain cysts. And basically it it marked it it made part of her body weak, and when she walked, she stumbled. So Ever, you know, if you watched her, she did not have a normal gait. And she took Tai Chi. I think it took about six months. Maybe it was a little bit longer. And over time, her gait got to be basically normal. And what she said is uh, she didn't have to practice Tai Chi every day. But I think she had, she said if she practiced, I don't remember the details. Maybe if she, if she practiced the form like, three times every two weeks or some kind of interval like that, she was able to maintain the benefit. Yeah. And if she didn't practice, then she sort of backslid. Rest of it, yeah. Yeah. So that was one thing. And then the same woman had cousins and she was kind of like a tomboy and she liked to roughhouse with the, with her cousins. 
Um, but you, I don't know what she used. But anyway, I taught her the bird speak, uh, the young bird speak. Yeah. And with it, there are, there are a number of different parries that you can have. <laughs> And then a, a number of different strikes that you can either with a wrist or with the fingertips. And so she was able to use that effectively to roughhouse with her cousins. So anyway. She valued and then, that as being able to walk. <laughs> yeah. And then the, the only other self-defense situation I had with Tai Chi was I had actually just come back from uh, California with Ben Lowe. And I was in the airport. And in those days, there were a lot of Hare Krishnas. And they would try to pin a flower on your shoulder. And then they would ask for money. And I was just been finishing. I had this army fatigue jacket over my shoulder. And as he was raising his arm to pin it, I just did roll back and just deflected him. And that was the end of it. So he didn't bother me at all. But that was my big, my, my big self-defense Tai Chi moment. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Those Hare Krishnas can be deadly. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah, I, I with the clipboard who's determined to get you to fill out the the uh, <laughs> uh, the little questionnaire he's got. Those are the ones that are like, you know. <laughs> anyway, I, I don't know what happened. We don't see them anymore. I don't know what happened. So anyway. I think they were cutting down on being able to access airport terminals. Ah, yeah. uh -huh, okay, yeah, All right. But I don't, you know, I don't see them. I don't see them on in the streets in big cities either. So, the uh, okay. So you've learned from several uh, famous teachers. Um, who have you been? Who the, who have you actually been a study a student of like that? So Chin Man Chain, you got the you got to meet there a little bit. And see. Right. So I, I wouldn't say I really learned it. I, I would say I would, for a short period of time, maybe six weeks, I was a student of William C.C. C. Chen. Yeah, William Chen. And then and Robert, Robert Smith. Smith. How long were you with Robert Smith? Well, I the residency was three years and I went off and on. Okay. Uh, I, it wasn't it wasn't real focus. It's, it was just something I did from time to time, and I don't remember how frequently. And then I went back for a fellowship uh, for a year, and I again I was off and on with that. Yeah. Cool. And then, uh, how long did you get to train with Ben Lowe? Oh, that was, uh, and I was just, you know, I was just facing the crowd, so I didn't get any personal attention from him. But he, I believe, it was a one week long workshop in La Honda, uh, California. That's what I remember. Yep, and then you talked a little bit about being able to study with um, with Don Drager. Right, yeah, that was very short, but that was just yeah, totally a wonderful experience, yeah. Yep, 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 okay. The, uh, what caused you to start studying with me? So you... you uh, oh, you know, that, that, that's a good question. Uh, you know. Right, no, that's... <laughs> And that that will fill out the 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 combat self defense question. <laughs> I, the combat self defense question is complex, and I just I just realized how how I didn't answer it quite as fully as I would like to. So um, I originally started with you because of Falcon because I wanted to have another energy system, and then so, but. As other people have mentioned, there are many Tai Chi instructors that either don't know or don't teach the combat parts of Tai Chi. And I definitely wanted to learn that. And so the fact that you have those skills and teach them is really cool. And the fact that you'll teach higher level things, specifically Dim Mok. So Dim Mok really fascinates me, okay? And so, you know, we've, we've looked at Poison Hand. We haven't looked at all the types of Dimma, but just the opportunity to, to really work with any part of Dimma is something that I, I really cherish. Okay. 
And so, um, and the fact that you teach the stuff and you don't hide it. And another part that I really want to emphasize is that you really invite questions and do your best to answer them. So, you know, so, and so if I have a technical question, I can call Matt and most of the time he can answer it. And if I had a question that he couldn't answer, he would either ask you or I would call back and call you. But, you know, uh, you know, you're not going to spend an hour on the phone with me, but if I have two or three questions that are burning, you'll take my call and answer. And that's a big deal. I've been, you know, I, I was working with the Francis organization. If you had a technical question, the guy on the phone probably knew the answer, but he wouldn't answer. He would just say, make an appointment with the instructor in Atlanta. And that was, you know. Okay. Okay. And I've been, I've gone to workshops, you know, and you'll answer every question that you can receive. Uh, and I've been at workshops where the main instructor said, well, you got one question. I'll answer one of your questions. Okay. And, yeah. and and that's not very satisfying. So, you know, and, and to some degree, he wanted to pass me on to his other senior instructors, and probably they would have an answer. But, you know, if I'm going to pay the money I did to go to the workshop and pay for the flight and, and the thing, I would like to get as many questions answered by him as he had time for. And, yeah, and I don't think... they pertain directly to the material that's being taught, then you're trying to understand it. So yeah. you should right. be able to do that. Yeah. So so that that so 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 being willing to teach the high level stuff and then being willing really making yourself available to questions is is like a really big deal. And then to you know the, to have both the, the healing and the combative parts of it is is like the cast me out. And then, you know, and then we've got into to some of the spiritual issues, particularly with the level up. And that's like a big deal. I studied, I studied uh, Tibetan Buddhism. And I'm kind of exploring uh, mystical Christianity and things that come up in different places. You know, what you teach all fits in. It's, it's like an extension of those studies uh, where... I'm not getting a lot of in, input from other people at this time from those sources. So, yeah. so that, that works very well for me.